Indie Mogul. This week on Indie News, my reaction to The Hobbit in 48 frames per second. I interview the director of The Underwater Realm, a series of short films actually shot underwater. And I compare my new Panasonic GH3 to my other camera, the Panasonic GH2. Hey Indie Mogulers, Griffin here. Last week my friends and I were first in line for the midnight premiere of The Hobbit in HFR 3D meaning it was shown at 48 frames per second. That's double the frame rate that most films are shot and projected at. When I asked them the next morning about the 48 frame experience, here's what my friends had to say. It just doesn't look normal and you're fighting to make it look normal. It seemed so sped up that it was like really quick and, and, and not natural, little movements like that. Like Matt, I also experienced the fast forwarding effect. Especially during handheld shots or when an actor moved quickly, it felt like the film was sped up. There were definitely times when it pulled me out of the movie but there were also times where I thought it worked really well, and a lot of the, the darker, heavy action scenes, I thought it was very cool to see all that clarity. I'm not sold on it completely, but I'm intrigued by it. As Nick said, doubling the frame rate is kind of like doubling the resolution. There's more visual information, so the picture looks clearer. It also reduces stutter between frames, and it seemed to me it made 3D more comfortable to watch. But the critics are right, 48 frames just looks weird sometimes. But for that, I don't blame Peter Jackson. I really blame myself. It's actually my brain's fault. A good analogy is tilt photography. The shallow depth of field appears to make things look like miniatures, but that's because usually we only see this super shallow depth of field when tiny objects are photographed with a macro lens. Our brains tell us it must be miniatures because we use past experiences to make sense of an image. So the same goes for high frame rate video. We're used to seeing movies at 24 frames per second, so when we see 48, our brains tell us, hey, maybe we're watching TV right now because there's more frames than cinema, or maybe it's being fast forwarded because I'm seeing twice as many frames every second. If everything was shot with a tilt lens, for example, we'd probably get used to the effect, our brains would, and it would look pretty normal. And I think the same goes for 48 frames. If more movies are shot this way, our brains would get used to it and we'd enjoy a clearer visual experience. So if you saw The Hobbit in high frame rate, let me know in the comments what you thought. I've always liked the Panasonic GH series of DSLRs. It seems like they're really well suited to videographers. And with the new GH3, it seems Panasonic really listened to filmmakers and added several helpful improvements. So today I'll show you how my new Panasonic GH3 stacks up against the previous model, the Panasonic GH2. On the right, the GH3's new magnesium alloy body is dustproof and splashproof, plus bigger and heavier than the GH2, in part because the battery has 50% more capacity. The new OLED display is 33% higher resolution with improved touchscreen sensitivity. And Panasonic added two extra dials and three extra customizable function buttons to the body, plus a normal sized microphone jack, yay, that's separate from the remote jack. And now with a headphone jack, I can finally monitor in-camera audio. It's like a camcorder now. To monitor live audio, there's a slight delay, but not really bad enough to be a problem. Strangely, you can't assign a shortcut to mic levels or headphone volume through the function buttons, but I did find you can jump to the playback screen as a quick way to adjust headphone volume. Unlike the GH2, which only has four levels for the onboard microphone, the GH3 has 19 to choose from. Both cameras have a built-in limiter to protect you from going too loud and distorting your audio. Visually, the GH3 adds several improvements, including 60 frames per second at 1080 resolution. On the GH2, 60 FPS is limited to 720. The GH3 allows you to change ISO while recording, which is super handy. Plus, you get double the ISO range. For some reason, Panasonic didn't give their new camera a multi-aspect sensor like the GH2 has, meaning that video on the GH3 is actually cropped a little tighter than the GH2. The tight crop factor was already a downside for Micro Four Thirds cameras, so it's a bummer they made it slightly worse. But fortunately, the new GH3 shoots at triple the bitrate, up to 72 megabits per second. 
This means higher quality, but it also means that I fit much less video on my SD cards. Lots of DSLR shooters like time-lapse, so Panasonic added a built-in intervalometer. Set an interval and how many photos you want to capture, and the camera does the rest. They also gave the GH3 Wi-Fi. It can connect to an existing network, or create its own wireless hotspot, which allows a smartphone to act as a remote. I can wirelessly preview the shot and adjust aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and white balance. Unfortunately, the live preview stops when I start recording, so it can't be used as a live monitor. And the remote focus doesn't work well, so right now I can't reliably replace my remote shutter, which I use primarily for focusing on myself. All in all, I'm excited about having a second DSLR body, and for me, the feature set warrants the $12.99 price tag, but for many filmmakers, these new features are unnecessary, and with the GH2 now selling for under $500, that may be the better deal. In fact, because of this crop factor on the GH3, I'll probably keep using my GH2 to shoot this shot on the show. That'll let me keep it on a tripod, and I can take the GH3 out for field shoots. We're one week away from the premiere of The Underwater Realm, an independent filmmaking project, much of which was shot underwater. So I interviewed director Dave Reynolds about his ambitious project. You set out to make a series of five short films that document the five times throughout history that mankind has come into contact with a race of people living on the bottom of the ocean. Made over the last two years, they were Kickstarter funded. We raised $100,000 on Kickstarter, um, and it's been a hell of a journey. Well, I must imagine there, there are quite a few challenges for shooting underwater. So what are some of the biggest ones and how did you overcome those? Uh, well, we thought first of all that the biggest challenge was gonna be getting a decent quality camera underwater, um, but actually that turned out to be surprisingly easy. There were so many people that kind of wanted to get involved in the project. We ended up shooting everything on Red Epic underwater with one of only 12 housings in the world. We've got one shot that isn't genuinely underwater. The rest of it is all genuinely underwater. We did, did a lot of experimentation with dry for wet, um, but it's just, it's not something we were looking to pursue. It just wasn't realistic enough. Uh, it just wasn't genuine, so we've decided to go in camera, and we've been shooting out in Hawaii, we've shot in the Red Sea in Egypt, we've shot in, in tanks here in the UK, um, but it's all genuinely 100% wet. When you're shooting underwater, who has to be underwater and who's above <laughs> ground? How, how do you coordinate all of that? We have DOP and, and myself, the director, up on the surface, big monitors doing live video feed out of the water, up onto a monitor, um, we have designed an underwater communication system so we can actually walk around with, with wireless mics talking to the divers and even without any earpieces the divers and the actors can all hear us on the surface. So in the end you have your safety divers in the water, you have your surface supervisor kind of coordinating those guys, all the actors obviously underwater and the camera operator and every, uh, apart from that everybody else is up on the surface. What's it like shooting with the Red Epic? Why, why did you choose that camera? What are you able to accomplish? 4K has been absolutely fantastic underwater, specifically the raw workflow, because as soon as you get in the water, um, obviously we all think of the water as being blue, but it's really just that it's so dense it eats away at all the red lights. All the red light dips down uh, and you get a really unbalanced exposure um, in, in your red channel. So you have to really boost that red channel to get skin tones back, and that introduces a hell of a lot of noise. Um, but you need as much flexibility as possible to be able to bring that back in in post. You can use red filters and you can color the light and all that, but you're always going to have to deal with some heavy color correction underwater. So you're able to get the, the camera underwater with an underwater housing. Is there other gear that's underwater? Do you have lights down there? Yeah, we actually manufactured a system of our own LED lights. Um, we started out with a kind of a Kina Flow idea and went, how can we make this work? We turned it into an LED Kina Flow and then we cut it up and then we set it inside a block of resin. There's uh, been a few revisions now for a set of very, very bright, soft LED panels that are completely submersible down to about 40 meters. It certainly changed the way we light underwater. The trouble with lighting from the surface is so much bounces back off the surface of the water, but it also creates kind of caustic patterns and rays, which are great sometimes, but if you're trying to light a green screen, you need it to be even, it can't come from the surface. So we create these nice big soft lights. We can light green screens or light backdrops or provide a little bit of fill for the talent. Because a lot of them have to do their scenes without gear. So are they, did they learn free diving or were they already pretty comfortable? We've had dancers, we've had actors with no free diving experience. We've had scuba divers, we've had 
bodybuilders, and then we've had professional freedivers. So one of our cast is actually the UK record holder, can hold his breath for 8 minutes and 19 seconds. It's all up here. Um, anybody can learn to hold their breath for 3 minutes in a week, just by relaxing. Now that you're near the end of it, looking back, are there things that you wish you did completely differently, knowing what you know now? If we could go back in time with the knowledge that we've got now, I think we'd probably go, let's not make an underwater film. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly difficult, but it's been the most rewarding, the most challenging experience of my life, and here's to many more. We're looking forward to going forward and making features with this world that we've built. One really important thing about the project is that 100% of the people involved throughout are completely voluntary. We haven't paid a single individual, and we're very, very strict on that to the point that it, it almost caused us problems where we had a massive problem that we could solve just by paying someone, but we couldn't justify that to ourselves. You know, everybody's a volunteer, so all that money's gone up on screen. We built a Spitfire replica, and we shot one of the five films with a 1942 Spitfire crashing into the ocean. We built a Spanish galleon that's 30 feet by 15 foot. It's raised up on a five ton concrete seesaw and it rocks from side to side so the light kind of travels through it. And we had filled that with sailors and they were firing cannons that really fired and it's all in camera. Turns out our budget is actually half the Hobbit's coffee budget, we found out recently. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. So a lot of what you're doing sounds very difficult. Are there things that look pretty cool that are actually pretty simple things that my audience who are pretty low budget, anything they can accomplish? The Spitfire, for example, that we've got, we, we managed to shoot and composite a Spitfire dogfight. So that's Spitfire being shot down by a bunch of Messerschmitts and giving as good as he gets, flying around over the skies of North Africa. Now, all of those CG shots are created by somebody who has got, what, a year and a half CG experience in this sort of thing, but has, has really been kind of learning it on the job uh, with this specific stuff. He's a, a modeler. Um, so that's all like desktop computing stuff. It's composited in After Effects. It's modeled in 3ds Max. That Spitfire was built out of baked bean tins. It was built out of spam. It had like old bits of bicycle, uh, a soda stream canister. It had you know all kinds of junk from around the house. Assuming that the camera is gonna be shaking around and, and you can get away with an awful lot. The dashboard's made out of Pringles pots. The message behind the films is like, you know, if you've got an idea and the story you really wanna tell is about a Spitfire dogfight, just go and do it. It's not that expensive. It's so easy to, to come up with limits and go, oh, well, you know, I couldn't do it because I need a CG budget of 10 grand and I need to build a Spitfire and that's going to cost 20 grand. It doesn't have to. We spent 700 quid or well, $700 on the Spitfire. Go and do it. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Dave. No worries. Thank you for having me. It's been good to yeah. talk about it. The five short films of the underwater realm will be released on Christmas Day in 4K on YouTube. On today's playlist, you'll find their YouTube channel here with a behind the scenes look. I also have their very cool trailer also on their channel. If you wanna learn more information about the GH3, I have an extended look on my personal channel and I have new and notable video contests from my friend Marissa. Hey, and next week on Indie News, on Christmas Eve actually, I'll show you my other new camera, the GoPro Hero 3 Black Edition. Thanks for watching.